Pirates. is made possible by the New Jersey State Bar Foundation, committed to educating the public about the law. Additional funding is provided by Lawyer's Diary and Manual. So the search for solutions goes on too. More education say some, more enforcement urged by others. But at one New Jersey high school, the answer's been consistent and controversial. I'm Raymond Brown, and we're talking today about random drug testing for kids, not just the ones who would seem to be at risk, but virtually any kid. For the how and the why and the where, we turn to Sarah. Raymond, the where is Hunter and Central High School, a largely white middle to upper class enclave where you might think drugs were no serious problem. That is, until you saw the stats. 900 and counting young folks killed by drugs in under two years. The why now? Because a testing program put on hold for three years while the ACLU tried to fight it was finally cleared last year by a state appellate court. But the most intriguing part comes in the how and who of it. The how, a simple scrape of the inner cheek. The who, well, potentially anyone and everyone enrolled at Hunter and Central. You, I understand. What do aspiring actors have in common with the jocks on the football team? At Hunter and Central High School, they're both equally subject to random testing for drugs. And they're not alone. At this school, anyone who plays a sport, takes part in any extracurricular activity, or even drives a car to school, can be tested for drugs at any time, even if there's no reason for suspicion. It's a deterrent program. You don't need to test everybody. You don't even need to test large numbers of kids. It's the idea that you could get tested. That is the, um, the deterrent piece. And if it works as it's designed to, drug use here could take a precipitous drop. Could the vast majority of students actually be deterred? Because 80% of these kids are potential candidates for testing. When we were doing drug testing, the numbers of drug use was down, and then when they stopped the drug testing, the number of drug use went up. The stop was court ordered, the result of a lawsuit brought by a few parents with the help of the ACLU. What we've argued is that under the New Jersey Constitution, the government has to show more evidence of a need than is required under the federal Constitution. Recently, in order to search, in order to search, search including a drug test, a drug test, exactly. And the suit at first was successful. A superior court judge saying the policy was unlawful invasion could cause the students irreparable harm. Some people look through drugs and then it's violating their personal space. It's unfair because it's an invasion of your privacy. When an individual, including a student, is told that they have to submit to a search, submit you know, to a test, um, you know, that they should have the right to ask why. But an appellate court last June disagreed. Drug testing was coming back to Hunter and Central and in a bigger, more aggressive way than any school district at any time in New Jersey. 
we have a drug issue here that is really no different than any other school. I think the difference with Hunter Intentional is that we have uh, taken a proactive approach to that. An approach that was launched here in December to very mixed reviews. First, there were the students lined up for us by the principal. Their opinion was unanimous. It keeps uh, a drug-free environment as, you know, it should be. It gets the people who are involved with sports to make sure that they're doing the right thing outside of school. It's important to make sure that kids are staying off of drugs. No one is really opposed to it. But off campus, in our own random interviews, we got a distinctly different story. It's our school. It's our education. They're not, they don't have control of our lives, so they shouldn't. They should only drug test people that look like they're on drugs instead of everyone that does sports or drives to school or anything. In fact, that's what state law provides for every school district, and even the ACLU can live with that. If they have individual suspicion of wrongdoing, you know, we don't object to, to that test. And, you know, in some cases it may be, um, you know, the duty of the school is to, to do that. All schools have an under suspicion testing program, and that simply means that if a student is um, identified as possibly being under the influence in school that day, then that student, the law is very clear on that, that student must be drug tested. But the overdose deaths of nine young people here in rural suburban Hunterdon over the last two years caused this school to conclude that the statewide policy just wasn't tough enough. So the state now has an all new model for finding drug abuse where it isn't so obvious. Uh, it's a good thing, because I hear it's an easy place to get the drug, so I think the students should be drug tested pretty randomly. I don't think it should be random, because that is invading people's privacy, and they don't have permission from them. They're just getting way too far, and it's yeah. not right. It's not fair at all. No, I'm not going to take it. I don't feel like it. <laughs> so I'm clean. I'm totally clean. Random testing began in December, just a few kids at a time, no big numbers. But that's not the point. The idea is that with no one knowing whom those few might be, all the kids are deterred from using drugs for fear that the next test could be theirs. So that's the hope, but is it working? Well, two months into the testing, school officials won't say how many have been tested or how many of those tested positive for drugs. But those who did have been referred not to cops or court, but to counseling. So though the ACLU is still hoping to derail the testing, Hunterdon Central's program is back in operation. And when we come back from the lawyer who won the case for Hunterdon Central, a longtime detective turned drug counselor who helped Hollywood define the cop show genre, and a Pulitzer Prize nominated author and former addict who claims the testing may do more harm to kids than help. So stay with us. or something, they shouldn't be doing drugs or anything, but like, if you're just like a person in the school, just randomly, I don't think they have the right to just come up to you and drug test you. The random drug testing of almost any and every kid raises more than just the legal questions of student search and student privacy. What about the practical side? Is it an effective tool for fighting drug use? Here with some very different answers, Kevin Kovacs, the lawyer who won the Hunter and Central case. Maya Salovitz, former addict and co-author of Recovery Options, The Complete Guide, who says Kovacs may have won a battle but helped to lose the war. And with us from Newark, former Newark detective Dave Toma, whose unique brand of fighting crime has inspired two TV series and is now back in Newark fighting drug addiction. Welcome to all of you. Hello. Kevin, since you've been at the heart of this particular storm from the beginning, let me start with a question not so much about the legal issues but about the policy question underlying it. 
why is it regarded as more effective to do random testing across virtually the whole student body as opposed to focusing on those kids where there might be either some suspicion or some reason to believe there's a drug problem? Well, it's, it's part of the entire picture. Uh, random drug testing at Hunter and Central works in conjunction with the suspicion-based testing and the anti-drug programs they put on. It's more of a deterrent because every uh, child who volunteers to participate in the uh, extracurricular activity knows they're subject to testing. And random dr and the suspicion-based drug testing itself has its own set of problems. But uh, no, obviously any testing system has issues, both legal and policy, but the thrust here is to put resources into something that affects the whole student body. This is the departure, this is what's new, as opposed to deepening, say, suspicion-based testing. So the question is, what is the rationale? Why do, obviously, some folks think this is more effective? Why? Well, it works. And it worked at Hunterdon Central for three years when they were testing uh, athletes from 1997 to 2000 before the program was attempted to be expanded. <laughs> Uh, athletes were tested, and it worked. Uh, approx approximately five to ten students would be tested per week randomly, and the amount of drug use uh, went down dramatically according to uh, anecdotal testimony from what coaches and teachers. Is, what happens when there is a test that shows a kid has used drugs? At Hunter and Central, it's not uh, uh, turned over to a prosecutor. There's no punishment intended. The idea is to deter, and secondly, to isolate and identify the users and problem users. And but get the them isolate counseling. and identify means what? They're counseled, they're sent to drug treatment? They, the student now would spend five sessions at a, a drug awareness program, and they would see a, a student assistant counselor who would determine based on an interview whether that student had just a random kind of problem, a, an isolated problem, or had a, a real problem that needed further counseling. Maya, what's wrong with that approach? Well, the problem is where do you, there are limited resources. How do you spend them? If you sort of cast a wide net, um, you may be um, taking kids out for intervention who would have grown out of the problem anyway. The vast majority of kids who use drugs grow out of it without any problem. And so if you take some of these kids and start um, putting them into counseling with kids who are having a real problem, you may expose them to more dangerous drugs which they are likely to overdose on and die, as opposed to just letting them grow out of it the way. So do you actually argue that a random system like this may make it worse in some instances? Well, yes, because you can take a kid who would have just, you know, passed through this experience and then send him to a treatment center, which tells him you are an addict, you will be an addict for the rest of your life, you must go to meetings for the rest of your life, you are powerless over your drug use. Um, that can create a self-fulfilling prophecy. And maybe even then create a person who's more deeply involved with drugs. Than exactly. Okay. Dave Toma, I don't want to make a judge out of you, but we do have two diametrically differing views of this program. What's your view? Very simple. Let me preface it by saying to all of you, since 1951, I am speaking. I've done over 40 million kids all over the world. I've given over 15,000 lectures. I've been in every high school and junior high you can think of in this country, 50 states in the union. And okay, I want to tell you. Tell us, get, I, because if you make a speech this. here, we won't have time for anybody else. So tell but us I what you're doing. I've got to say this, Ray. Go ahead. Approximately 70 to 80 percent of the kids in every school I've been in tells me they're into drugs. We have an epidemic that's pandemic. It's, it's horrendous. I will say to the kids every day, let me ask you a question after I'm done speaking. I spend several hours in school. What do you think some of the things that would help this school or any school or this society? And everyone says, Mr. Toma, truthfully, they should drug random all of us. So you don't agree with my that there's any possibility that some kid may be driven more deeply into the drug universe by being singled out in this way no, after no. they've sampled or done something that is not likely to lead to deeper addiction by no, itself? No, no, not at all, because we have a misconception of addiction. When you smoke pot, if you smoke pot and you don't smoke pot for not seven or eight months, you have an addiction. You went seven or eight months later because you have a problem. You have a drug all problem. Right, Maya, you don't have right, to wait. Right, Dave, all right, Dave, Maya. That's, I, that's not any definition of addiction. Addiction is compulsive use despite negative consequences. If no, you, you don't know what you're use, Dave, let her finish. Let her finish, Dave. I've written a book on drug addiction, and I've spoken I with most of the academics. Okay, we won't weigh the number of books, Dave. Let's let her speak. Go ahead. Um, the, the way psychiatrists define addiction is compulsive use despite repeated negative consequences. 
consequences. The vast majority of kids are not using drugs in their 20s. Some of them try them um, when they are in their teens, but the vast majority of them, you can look at the statistics from the National Institute on Drug Abuse, which obviously isn't going to be biased in a liberal direction, um, and you find that by age 30, you only have 3.1% of the population using as opposed to 30 to 40% who tried it in their teens. Kevin, let me ask you this. Uh, this is an interesting critique that Maya offers, with which Dave disagrees. Um, in the process of formulating this policy, was there an examination about whether there was a downside involving this question of driving kids who might be casual users, not likely to, get, to fall into deeper drug use into a negative road? Well, I, I, I think there's two issues here. One is, what are you going to do to try to deter drug use? And then second, what are you going to do once you uh, identify the drug users? Uh, and, and we're talking now about the second issue. What do you do once you identify them? Uh, and I think uh, I've, I've seen schools out there in New Jersey, and I've represented a student in a school uh, where they're back in the, in the ninth century in terms of what they do once they identify a student. They kick them out, uh, and, and, and that's just not the way to deal with it. To kick a student out because of a one-time marijuana use is, is, I would agree with Myra, you don't want to do that. You don't want to isolate that student and put them in with other drug users. But that's not what Hunterdon Central does, and that's not what the more advanced uh, idea here is. Uh, you do the random drug testing, you identify those students, many, many of whom, in, uh, according to surveys, are not just using marijuana, but are using heroin. And, and what do you do with those students at that point? I don't uh, necessarily agree that Hunterdon Central doesn't punish the kid. They don't put them into, uh, necessarily in a treatment does the, session. Does the isolation or identification of a kid, let's say a kid who's experimenting with heroin, is there a downside to that? Because Maya seems to be suggesting no, that. I'm not, no, if, if I'm somebody's not. Got, if somebody's gotten to the point where they're using heroin, um, they probably have a problem. Um, and you want to um, deter that. Um, the what problem about also point that, that since they have what he calls a more progressive approach and are trying not to stigmatize students, that the downside you're concerned about isn't really a, a concern? Well, the problem is that the vast majority of kids are using marijuana. And what happens when you drug test is that marijuana can stay in your system for two or three weeks, but cocaine and heroin only stays in for a day. You don't want to be driving people from marijuana to the harder drugs to avoid a positive test. Dave, one of the distinctions we seem to be looking at here is the difference between marijuana and heroin. Does the nature of the drug, to some extent, drive what's an effective response to it? Well, let me say this to you. <laughs> First of all, I want to tell a young lady, she said she's written a book. I've got to respond to that. I've written eight books, and psychiatrists are using my books for a little bit of a reference. So I'd like to send you a couple of my books. But second of all, let me say again to you, we have an epidemic right now of heroin that is so bad. I mean, as many people are smoking pot are using heroin. That's just now, not true. well, she doesn't know what she's talking about then. Let me just tell you this. I'm, I, I'm, I'm in a treatment center today, yesterday, and the day before. And every time I go into a treatment center, I got to tell you, Ray, every time I'll say to you, are all of you using heroin? Yes. They, they, many they, of you started with pot. Everyone started with pot and went to heroin. Almost every one. No, is, is, that, there just is, so my, is that still the dominant well, thought in well, treatment? There's, no. There's so many, um, there's like millions and millions, um, maybe 30, 40 million people have tried marijuana. Only one to two million in the country have tried heroin. You look at the statistics. Oh the God. problem is what he's, what he's talking about is called the clinician's error. He sees a sample of people who are in a treatment center. Those are the people who really have the problems. What he doesn't see are the people who smoke pot on weekends when they were a kid and are now lawyers, are doctors, are presidents, um, and are doing fine. If we, if we think about our own experience, I was a drug addict, I had a serious problem, but most of the people around me did not. Kevin, it's hard not to see that one of the arguments here, and it's one that's been an ancient part of the drug discourse, is that there are differing approaches to different substances because they're pharmacologically different. Exactly. Is that part of the discussion that led to Hunted and Central, and is there a difference within the program of how you treat a kid who you think has smoked marijuana for a couple of times versus a kid who may be involved with heroin? Well, in, in terms of the, the treatment, I really don't, uh, I, I would uh, defer to Myra in terms of what is the appropriate treatment for a, a student who's using marijuana uh, or using heroin. Uh, I do know that this, the, before 100 and Central uh, implemented this program uh, to all extracurricular activities, they had a task force uh, investigate the uh, situation who determined that uh, it wasn't just marijuana use that was going on, uh, although a third 
of the students had admitted to having used marijuana, but we had between 10 and 15 percent of students who had admitted to having used and tried cocaine uh, and uh, hallucinogens and other kinds of drugs. That is really the concern. Now, um, uh, so, but what what is the appropriate treatment? I would defer to my. Let me ask you a parenting question. Mm -hmm. Can a parent? opt out of this on behalf of their kids, except well, by pulling their kids out of all the extracurricular programs. Well, the, the program has that element of consent to it because it isn't uh, across the board to every student. It's only the students who want to participate in the extracurricular activities every who get it. Even, 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 even in the college. ancient days when you and I went to college, it was yeah. kind of important, essential, yeah. to be involved in some extracurricular. So the kid is saying giving up a, a, a significant shot at college to stay out of extracurricular, not to mention a quality of life. So yeah. are you saying that the only way out is to not do extracurricular? Well, if, if they won't consent to go through the random drug testing, which is a condition of the extracurricular activity, it's so not. So that's yes. That's that yes. a parent can't take the kid out of the, 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 the random. Dave, what are your thoughts about that? Well, I didn't even ask about your parenting experience, but what are your thoughts about it? Well, let me, Ray. Sure. Most parents are not aware of, of what's going on, or they don't want to be aware, or they think it's going to go away at, at home. So, uh, uh, again, parents say, well, I don't think so, I don't think so. But i got to preface this by saying it. I feel, and what we are in a situation today, everybody should be drug tested. We are in an epidemic. This is worse than what happened at 9-11. We fell asleep. We fell asleep in 9-11. We're falling asleep in schools, and all the schools, and I, I'd is like to Is that a team meeting of teachers, Dave, at 100 and Central? If you were running the program, would they text the teachers and the principal? Why not? Why not? I mean, why wouldn't the principal and the teacher say, you know what, I'm clean. Do what you have to do. Right, would that affect your view of the program if everybody in this universe was I subject mean, to it? No, because that's even more a violation of civil liberties. Um, you know, what he's saying about this epidemic is just not borne out by the statistics. We have much lower drug use. The recent statistics from high schools are showing that it is declining. Completely um, wrong. And, Completely you know, the wrong. statistic, there are many, there could be many problems with it. But the mass, we had the drug use, according to the National Institute on Drug Abuse, peaked in 1980. Um, that we had 70% of kids trying marijuana in 1980. And the society's okay now. But um, it's now about 40%. Kevin, any likelihood that the program might be expanded to include teachers, uh, maybe visitors, uh, and others who are in the universe of Iowa Central? Well, the, there's 20% of the students who don't participate in any extracurricular activities, and they are not drug tested, and there's no thought at this point to, to include them. Can I ask you what sense that makes? If the logic is that random testing is going to help us deter and treat, and it's a good logic, why would you exclude kids who, by their isolation from social activities surrounding the school, might be just as much in need of some kind of outreach as I am? Well, it, it, it goes to a legal issue in terms of the idea of consent idea of voluntariness on the part of the student and their parents. Uh, students don't voluntarily go to high school. So you think from a policy point school. of view they might consider it, but legally there's an additional barrier? Well, I think that's the ne perhaps the next legal step is can, uh, assuming the Supreme Court affirms the appellate division in our case and we, we are successful there, per, you know, that would be the next step for the next high school. Of course, and the legal issues are all still alive because the ACLU is still hoping that they Correct. We're still, the case isn't over with yet. We're, uh, it's still before the New Jersey Supreme Court. And there is a problem with targeting extracurriculars, which is that um, extracurriculars are a very good way to keep kids away from drugs. So you got a kid who's like, well, you know, uh, maybe I'll join the drama club, but you know what, mm, you know, I want to smoke some pot, so I won't join the drama club, and then they get drawn more into Dave, it. would you think there's a distinction in drug use between kids who are in and extracurriculars and those out? Are you, are you talking about extracurricular? Are you talking about sports and things like Foot, that? Sort? Football, the drama club, kids who are active in ac No, no, around. there's no distinction. Not at all. Kids are lost today. Kids want to be loved. Kids want to be cared for. Kids want to feel important. They're looking for something. Do you They're think they also want to be tested? Do, do I think they want to be tested? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Most of them tell me they do. I might get a handful to say, well, I don't want it, and I say, why not? If you're clean, why wouldn't you want to be tested? As we wind down, Dave, what's your prediction as to whether programs like this are going to expand throughout New Jersey and maybe the country? I hope so. Okay. I hope so for our own protection in this society. But do you if think it's likely there will be more of them? I hope so. I don't know. Okay. I really don't know. But I hope we have more, liars, more lawyers like he is. 
God bless them because if we don't, we're in a, we're in a lot of trouble today. I, I would like every one of you to come to hear me speak the next time I do a lecture. At three or four I'd like to do that, although you also got to read Maya's book. Maya, likely to be more of these kind of programs, even though you're critical of them in your book? Um, I think so. Um, I, but, I, you know, the trend is, is people are realizing that zero tolerance has some excesses. Um, he defended a student who was kicked out of school, which was definitely doing more harm than the drug use. Um, so I think we probably will see more, but hopefully Kev peak. Kevin's in the middle of all this. Two quick questions. Are you going to survive the Supreme Court challenge, and will we see these programs elsewhere? you got 10 seconds. Number one, yes to the first question. Uh, we have the right qu uh, answer to that legally. Mm -hmm. And number two, I think it's important to give school boards that tool. And as more school boards have that tool, those so who need it will use it. More, yes or no? Those who need it will use it, and yes, there will be more okay. drug testing. Well, that's something we'll have a chance to check out, evaluate, and maybe reconvene this conversation. But for now, thank you, because that's it for this edition of Due Process. The really tough issues don't ever go away, so we'll be back next week with another cutting-edge issue of law and social justice. Till then, for Sandy King and all of us here, I'm Raymond Brown. Thanks for watching. should be done because, I mean, kids will find a way to get around it. Like, kids always find a way to get around testing and things like that. Like, uh, they'll just go after the drugs that don't come up on drug tests. I know that when kids were in season and they have the chance of getting drug tested, they weren't doing drugs or drinking because they knew that they could potentially be caught. I do know people who are, do use drugs, but, and that they do abuse them, but those are, again, the people who aren't involved in sports and extracurricular activities. Major funding for due process was made possible by the New Jersey State Bar Foundation, committed to educating the public about the law. Additional funding was provided by Lawyer's Diary and Manual.